Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Javier Brum, and I'm leading this year's organization committee for IEEE UFFC Latin American webinars, together with Patricia Cardoso de Andrade, Andrea Pulido, Sophie Morse, and Molly Bracken from Conference Catalyst. It is our pleasure to kickstart this first webinar of this Latin America webinar series. Just a few details on today's webinar. You can type questions using the chat box anytime during or after the lecture to be addressed in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. A new feature is that questions can be in Portuguese or Spanish if preferred, Andrea, uh, Patricia, and I will be handling translations, so uh, please be a little bit patient with that. Uh, the entire session will be recorded and placed on the Society's YouTube channel for review, or for those who weren't able to join us today. So for today, we will have an early career and a senior speaker who will be introduced in just a moment by today's moderator, Stefan Catelin from Laptau in CERM in Lyon, France. I had the pleasure to meet Stefan back in 2005 when, uh, when he was in our lab during a two year mission uh, where we worked together on time reversal of shear waves along with Nicolas too. Uh, then he was my PhD co supervisor between, our, uh, between Uruguay and France when he was at Easter in Grenoble. He's an, an expert in, in wave physics and its multiple applications, especially elastography, time reversal, and seismology, just to mention a few. So, Steph, thank you very much for accepting moderating this webinar, and it's a real pleasure having you here. So, please. Thank you very much, Javier Broom. Uh, it's an honor for me and a pleasure, of course, uh, to be here for this Latin American webinar. So they will have, uh, we'll have to the tonight or uh, today for you two presentations, uh, and both are treating about elasticity from two different points of view, as we will see. And the first one will be given by David Alejandro Collazos Burbano from the Universidad del Valle, Cali, Colombia. So he's a researcher at the Center of Bioinformatic uh, and Photonics. And uh, he's uh, currently also a PhD candidate in this same uh, university. Uh, he had a young researcher fellowship from uh, Colciencias in Colombia in 2013. He took part in a youth stay of excellence at the research centers in optics, Leon, Guanajuato, in Mexico, in 2016. And he also received the best student paper award at the 2021 IEEE Latin America Acrosonic Symposium. So with this said, I leave the floor to David for his presentation. Hi everyone, my name is David Fugiasus, and today I'll talk about pulse photoacoustics, a powerful non-invasive and non-contact ultrasonic technique for agro-industry applications. I'll start by giving the motivation behind this work. Next, I mentioned the, the experimental setup. Next, conclusions and the potential applications. We want to use pulse photoacoustics to evaluate the elastic properties of plant tissues. And also we want to estimate the water content using the laser-based ultrasound techniques. We use coffee because it is important for many countries, especially for those countries located at the coffee bean growing belt. The experimental setup is this. We use a pulse laser at 532 nanometers of wavelength 
and six nanoseconds of pulse width. Also, we use a laser Doppler vibrometer to measure the vibration of the samples as the wave propagates inside it. When the pulse laser impinges the surface of the sample, it generates a sudden thermoelastic response that generate inside the samples shear and longitudinal waves that travels inside the leaves and when they find the inner surfaces they reflect generating two new shear and longitudinal waves and uh, when they combine each other they produce a new wave that is a guided wave or a plate wave these plate waves can be present in two modes one that is symmetric and the other that is antisymmetric and uh, every mode can have several orders for example symmetric order zero one two and so on to infinity and the same applies for the antisymmetric mode the simplest way to analyze the propagation of this mode is used in the Rayleigh Lamb equations that holds for isotropic, homogeneous, and single layer plates. Um, these equations include the geometrical and elastic properties. The geometry is given by the thickness, in this case D. And the elastic properties are given by the longitudinal and the transverse speed. In this work, we said the energy of the pulse laser to be 0.4 millijoules because it allows for a low attrition in the surface of the samples and also allows the generation of the plate waves. Also, we use galvanometric mirrors to scan the surface of the samples in several paths. For example, linear paths, A and C and B and D, when we study the midriff of the samples, or A prime, C prime, B prime, and D prime, when we study the lamina. And also, we make circular scanning when we want to follow the propagation of the plate waves. For example, here we can see the propagation of the plate wave in the lamina of the leaf. We can see that the propagation is homogeneous in all directions, which indicates that the phase velocity of the plate wave is the same in all directions. We can see two planes, the instantaneous amplitude plane and the instantaneous phase plane. These are two representations of the same phenomenon. One looking the amplitude and the other looking the phase. Using this scheme, we can also retrieve the characteristic diagram. Uh, this is the distance versus the time um, diagram of the propagation. Um, in this case, we, uh, we see the propagation along the midrip the path AC and perpendicular to the midrip, the path BD. The frames A and C show the amplitudes and the frames B and D show the phases. In the phase plane, we can see that the propagation is symmetrical with respect to the epicenter. The epicenter is the point in front of the infringing zone. And uh, this is marked as the discontinuous line in black here. And we can see that the propagation is symmetrical. It falls along the midrib and perpendicular to the midrib. In the amplitude planes, we can see that the amplitude change as the observation is made from point A to point C or from point B to point D. And this is related to the water content in the leaves. As the leaf uh, loses water, the amplitude of the vibration uh, is higher. 
So uh, this uh, this shows a uh, sense a sensitivity of the plate waves to the water content of the sample. Using the laser-based ultrasound technique, we can also uh, obtain the dispersion curves of the medium. We obtain the dispersion curve of the medium in red, for example, and um, the dispersion curve of the lamina in black. If we use the definition of the phase velocity, this is the angular frequency over the wave number, we can obtain uh, the these polar planes at several frequencies, in this case 19, 43, and 68 kilohertz. And we can see how the phase velocity change in both the midrip and the lamina when we make circular scanning. In the lamina, which are the black dots, we can see that the propagation is homogeneous at all directions or in all directions. Uh, but when we see the midrip, we see that the phase speed is higher when we measure over the midrip than outside the midrip. To estimate the effective properties, we use um, this procedure. This procedure is divided in three blocks. The first block is the experimental data block, which allows for the reconstruction of the dispersion curves experimentally. The second block is the model block, which includes the Rayleigh lamp equations that allow us to find the thickness, the longitudinal and the transverse speeds. And the final block is the block that allows for the solution of the inverse problem using optimization. This is, we use a numerical method to find edge, CL, CP using this model so that this model fits the experimental results observed with the laser-based ultrasound technique. When we solve this problem, we retrieve the longitudinal and the transverse speeds, and when we compare the associated elastic properties, these are the Young's modules and the Poisson ratio, we see that these values are very similar to those reported by alternative methods, for example, biological methods. Uh, and we can also compare the result using alternative method, uh, for example, resonance spectroscopy using air couple ultrasound. And we see that the results also are uh, very similar. We make a complete uh, comparison in this paper, and we see that the results are very promising. Finally, I would like to say three things. The first that we can obtain elastic properties for coffee leaves using a full photosynthesis technique. And this is important because we get information directly from the tissues that we can leave. Also, the laser based ultrasound is an sensing method that be useful for plant physiologies, uh, for example, those new fundamentary vegetation indices and bases on ultrasonic information. And also this is a new sensing method that could support the perception layer of the Internet of Things architecture. And this method uh, allows for an online measurement and the generation of massive data which includes uh, vibratory pattern, modulus of elasticity, the velocity of propagation of the plate waves, and this is compatible with, with the big data analysis. These are the references mentioned before, and I would like to say thank you. Thank you, David, for this very clear presentation. And uh, we will now move to the second presentation. It will be given by Nicola Benetch. 
He's professor uh, at the Physics Institute of the Science School Universidad de la República in Montevideo, Uruguay. Uh, he teaches wave physics to undergraduate and graduate students, including a PhD. His research interest areas include physics, physical acoustics, wave propagation in soft solids, ultrasound elastography. He holds one patent related to surface wave elastography apply, applied in the beef industry. So we move from plants to meat now. Currently, he's the head of the physics area of the Programa para el Desarrollo de las Ciencias Básicas, so a government program that funds researcher and graduate students in physics. So let's listen to Nicola Benech right now. Hello, my name is Nicolas Benech and I will present you the talk entitled Recent, uh, Recent Advances in Skeletal Muscle Elastography in the Lab, which is the Laboratorio Acústica Ultra Sonora in the School of Science in the Universidad de la República in Uruguay. Here is a summary of the talk. I will start with a brief introduction to skeletal muscle elastography. Then I will show our approach to estimate the attenuation of shear waves in muscles. After that, I will talk about elastography from surface wave measurements, a project in which I have been working in the last three years. Then I will show you some results from a project in 3D shear elasticity imaging, and finally the concluding remarks. The topics discussed here have in common that they are ongoing projects in our lab. Some of them are more advanced than others, as will become clear in the presentation. From the point of view of elastography, skeletal muscle is usually modeled as a transversal isotropic solid. The muscle fibers, grouped in fascicles, define a symmetry axis. The elastic properties in a plane perpendicular to this axis are isotropic, while they depend on the propagation direction in a plane which contains the symmetry axis. Therefore, we need five elastic constants to describe the elasticity. However, since muscles are, are soft tissues, the incompressibility introduces the constraint that the balloon remains contact under stress, and only three of them are independent. For example, the transverse shear modulus, the parallel shear modulus, and the ratio between transverse and parallel young moduli. In shear wave elasticity imaging, an ultrasound transducer is employed to generate a push beam as a source for shear waves. Depending on how the push beam is oriented with respect to the fibers, the type of shear rate propagation that will take place. If the push beam is perpendicular to the fibers, the shear horizontal mode propagates. In this case, only two elastic constants are involved, namely the transfer and parallel shear mode. And the observed velocity has a simple relation with them. However, if the push beam is not perpendicular to the fibers, as in the case of pinnated muscles, the propagation also includes the shear vertical mode. In this case, there is no simply analytical expression for the observer velocity in terms of the elastic moduli, and a single measurement is not enough to generate the shear elastic modulus. Thus, in this talk, we will focus on the shear horizontal mode propagation. In this first part of the talk, I will show you a wor work led by Eliana Budeli, whose goal is to estimate viscosity attenuation of shear waves in skeletal muscle. A sample uses a piece of bottom round beef. By orientating the probe parallel or perpendicular to the fibers, we can assess the corresponding velocity, highlighting the anisotropy of the muscle. This is a known result already shown by other authors. The attenuation of shear waves, however, has received less attention. It can be measured for each direction as displayed here, where we computed the attenuation for a 100 Hz central frequency. We note that the observed attenuation is not entirely due to viscosity, because it includes geometrical attenuation, that is, diffraction, due to the shape of the shear wave source, which is approximately a finite a line source embedded in the bulk of the medium. Thus, a diffraction correction is needed to properly estimate the shear viscosity in the beef sample. 
The diffraction correction is computed in two steps. In the first step, the push beam is simulated using field choose software. The parameters used in the simulation are those corresponding to the experimental setup, especially the depth of each push. The force field computed in the first step is used as input in the second step to compute the 3D displacement field in a transversing isotropic solid using the SAC Brings function. This includes the knowledge of uh, the elastic constants of the solid. Here, use the shear modulus obtained experimentally. For the other moduli, use values taken, taken from the literature. Details about this step can be found in the work by Eliana Budelli. As a result of the simulation, we have the 3D displacement field generated by the push beam. This video shows the time evolution of the field at a constant depth. From here, the attenuation of the shear wave can be computed in both directions, parallel and perpendicular to the symmetry axis. This course can be used to compensate for diffraction in the experimental results. Now, we assume that the attenuation which remains after correction is due to viscosity, and we obtain these values for parallel and perpendicular propagation directions. To find out whether the numerical values obtained are meaningful, we compare them with previous works in the literature. Here are the attenuation values measured by Stefan Catalin and collaborators in 2004 in beef samples. They used plain shear waves generated by this plate with polarization perpendicular to the mass of fibers and recorded the parallel propagation using an ultrafast scan. We can observe that the numerical values they obtained are comparable to the ones presented in this work. This work is still in progress and currently we are working on an analytical model for diffraction correction based on cylindrical waves in transversal isotropic solids. Now, we enter into the second part of this talk, which is about elastography from surface wave measurements, a topic in which I have been working in the past three years. Let's start to introduce the case of the isotropic solid because it is simpler to model and thus to understand the physics. Consider a line source acting impulsively on the free surface of a semi-infinite solid. In such case, it is crucial to consider that only a Rayleigh wave propagates along the surface. Thus, the elasticity estimation is straightforward since there is a simple relation between the Rayleigh velocity and the shear wave velocity in a soft solid. However, if we consider that the shear wave length is centimeter sized, the measurements are performed within the near field of the source. Thus, we need a closer look to the surface wave propagation. For this problem, an analytical expression of the Green's function is available. It has two terms, depending of on the normalized arrival time tau. The first time, term contains the arrival time of the compressional wave when tau equals gamma and the shear wave when tau equals 1. The denominator of this term is the Rayleigh circular equation, but there are no real roots in the domain of time between gamma and 1. Only complex roots are present here. The complex roots correspond to a physical wave called the leaky surface wave or the super shear evanescent wave depending on the outer. It is a near field wave because it has an exponential decay. The second function, named F2 here, corresponds to the Rayleigh wave. We note that the denominator has a real root for tau greater than 1 and therefore a singularity at this point. Here, we show plots of those two functions. In the left, the plots for F1, where the arrival time of the compressional and shear waves are displayed. Also, the arrival time of the leaky or super shear evanescent wave is displayed with the letter L. In order to be able to treat this term analytically in a simple way, we approximate it by a Gaussian function shown in blue in the figure. The function F2 is displayed in here in the right, and the sharp arrival corresponds to the Rayleigh wave, and we model it as the time derivative of a Dirac delta function. 
Those two simplifications in the Green's function allow us to compute the surface wave field analytically for any input in the source. From this simplified Green's function, we computed the surface wave field due to one sample of 100 Hz sinusoidal excitation, where the Rayleigh wave and the leaky waves can be seen. We repeat this procedure for different excitation frequencies and computed the phase velocity for each frequency. The result is the dispersion curve shown in the right figure here. The curve tends asymptotically to the Rayleigh wave velocity. However, we note that this is not a plate mode, since the solid is semi-infinite. This curve is due to interference between the Rayleigh wave and the leaky wave. In addition, we note that many authors estimate the viscosity of such solids from dispersion curves of surface waves. In a perfect elastic solid, the Rayleigh wave is, is non-dispersive. Therefore, dispersion is attributed to viscosity. However, our results show that this might not be the case in every experimental situation. Now, we consider the case where the medium is bounded by a lower surface, which can be a second solid with different mechanical properties given by the primes in their values. We consider that the velocity of the compression and shear wave in the second solid are much larger than the shear wave in the soft solid. Thus, the reflected waves have special characteristics. The Snell law implies that the horizontal component of the wave vector is kept constant during the reflection and transmission. Due to the huge difference in velocity values of the compression and shear waves in the soft solid, the compressional wave number is much smaller than the shear wave number. Therefore, more conversion is negligible at this interface, and the incoming shear wave reflects back as a shear wave without mode conversion to compressional wave. In addition, the line source is a dipolar source for shear waves, and the directivity pattern implies that most of the energy is directed towards 34 degrees from the source. Thus, expect a reflected shear wave arrival at a distance xs from the source. This distance defines a near field region where only surface wave propagate without influence of the lower surface. Now, if we compute the dispersion curve, including the reflected shear wave, we observe local uh, maxima caused by the interference between the different surface wave types. We know that this curve still does not correspond to a lamp plate mode. The theoretical analysis presented before is confirmed by experimental results. Here, we used an ultra-fast scanner to image the bulk and surface wave field generated by a linear source acting on a free surface of an agar gelatin-based phantom. This image of the surface displacement field at two different excitation frequencies, 100 Hz and 160 Hz. We can observe interference effects between surface waves at different distances from the source, depending on the frequency. This confirms the presence of different surface waves. Here, we compare the experimental dispersion curve with anti-symmetric and symmetric lamp plate modes, A0, A1, and S0. We note that they don't fit well the experimental values. However, if the field is measured at distance much, much greater than Xs, then the A0 mode fits the experimental dispersion curve. Finally, in this figure, we observe that the face, the face of the bulk field with a contour plot superimposed. We note that in the near field, the wave fronts form an angle with respect to the propagation direction, whereas in the far field, the wave fronts are planes parallel each other, perpendicular to the propagation direction. Thus, in this figure, you can observe the distance, again the distance of, of influence of the near field waves. Now, we show applications of the theoretical dispersion curve from the simplified Green's functions to estimate the shear wave velocity in agri-food samples. In this experiment, we used contact piezoelectric sensors to record the surface waves 
and compute the velocity as function of frequency. These figures show the experimental dispersion curves for a mozzarella type cheese and for a sample of bovine liver. The continuous lines are a fit with the theoretical curves from, the, from where the shear wave velocity is retrieved in each case. We note that the goodness of the fit in the cheese sample is lower than that of the line. We believe that this is due to diffraction effects, since in the theoretical model, the linear source is infinite, but in practice, its size can be comparable to the wavelength, especially at low frequencies. Other researchers have used the liquid or super shear wave to estimate the elasticity with a different approach. In this work by Peiter and collaborators, they showed that by using finite element simulations that the super shear wave propagates twice as fast as the shear wave. In addition, they show that this relationship is independent of the thickness of the solid, confirming the existence of a near distance Xs where the surface where only surface wave propagate without the influence of the lower interface. Then they used optical coherence elastography in vivo cornea samples to estimate the shear elasticity by measuring the velocity of the super shear wave. Therefore, they can estimate the shear elasticity without fitting with dispersion curves. As a theoretical background for isotropic solids, we employed surface wave measurements in beef samples. In this case, there is no simply analytical expressions for the Green's function on the surface of the solid. The Green's function is given in terms of integral expressions. The Rayleigh secular equation in this case has simple expressions for longitudinal and transverse propagation. As in the isotropic case, they have real and complex roots for incompressible solids, showing the existence of near field waves. We computed them numerically to account with a theoretical dispersion curve. We developed a prototype to excite and measure the surface wave field using contact piezoelectric sensors. The device has a handle to ease the manipulation during the experiment. We can record the wave field for different ex excitation frequencies and plot the dispersion curve for each direction. Here we show the results for two different beef samples of bottom round, together with the theoretical fit in each case, from where the corresponding shear wave speed can be retrieved. In the next step, use this device to monitor enzymatic maturation of different beef cuts. The samples were kept in a cold room at zero degrees Celsius, and we measured each of them every day during 21 consecutive days. The results show that the elastic modulus decreased as a function of time, and that eventually it is possible to estimate an optimal maturation time for each good type. From the previous results, we started a project with a local company, ITP, to measure the shear elasticity of beef samples within a slaughterhouse in order to classify the cuts according to their elasticity and increase their commercial value. This is an ongoing project without a published result yet. Finally, using the surface wave method to estimate the shear elasticity in vivo. We placed the contact sensors in a bracelet and attached it to volunteers while they were asked to perform some tasks in a biodex dynamometer. Used an external speaker with a line source attached to it to generate the surface waves. We measured the shear wave velocity in the bicep brachii and in the triceps. The volunteers were asked to contrast the muscles until a 40% of the maximum voluntary contraction, then keep this contraction for during 5 seconds, and finally to relax back to the resting position. The dynamometer offers a visual guide to the volunteer to perform the task. The figures here show the results of the shear elasticity value in the biceps of four volunteers. We observe that the measurements have a good correlation with the task performed. 
The measurements for the triceps show that there is no significant variation in the sheer elasticity of this muscle during the task. This result is in agreement with previous studies using electromyography showing that the triceps do not activate during isometric contraction. Currently, we are working in a miniaturized version of the surface weight device with the idea of measuring multiple muscles simultaneously. This is an ongoing study which is part of the PhD thesis of Gustavo Grispan in our lab. To finish this talk, I will show you briefly a project we are involved with Miguel Bernal from Verasonics to perform 3D elasticity imaging. We are using a row column array to acquire volumetric ultrasound images. The row column array consists on two orthogonal linear array, which are combined in a transmit-receive sequence to form a 2D array, but keeping the number of elements limited, so it can be used in a standard ultrasonic device, in our case with 128 channels. We built a bilayered phantom based on agar and gelatin. Each layer has a different concentration of agar, and thus they have different elasticity values. Here is a volumetric B-mode image, and the idea is to construct a 3D elasticity image of this phantom. For that, use the concept of passive elastography to generate a diffuse field inside the phantom by finger tapering it, while a Verasonics Vantage system was used to acquire 400 volumetric frames with 200 Hz repetition frequency. Then, we computed the displacement wave field Psi by classical spectral tracking methods. From this data, we computed the spatial and temporal derivative of the wave field and performed the cross correlation at each position. This, finally, the shear wave velocity can be estimated by computing the square root of the ratio between the, those cross correlated fields. This is a 3D image of the shear wave velocity in the phantom, where the two layers are clearly distinguished. Now we are working on, an Im on imaging phantoms with small inclusion and on extending the theoretical background of passive elastography to image anisotropic solid like skeletal mass net. As concluding remarks, we presented different approaches to estimate the elastic and viscoelastic properties properties of skeletal mass net, including classical shear wave elastography and also surface wave measurements. This work are still in progress and need further research, especially about the theoretical background for transversely isotropic solids, which will help us to improve the interpretation of the experimental results. Thank you for your attention and here are some of our responses. Thank you, Nicola, for this uh, nice presentation. Um, so we'll start now the questions. Um, and just take a look at um, if we already have questions there. Um, so uh, not yet, David. So I'm going to ask the first question to David, maybe. Uh, see, yes, we have some. So, but uh, my question to David uh, is the following. Uh, so, in the leaf, you with the laser, you generate a wave at the surface, and then you, with another laser, you can detect how the guided waves, uh, how the guided waves propagate. Uh, and then you can deduce the wave speed, the two wave speeds thanks to a model that you're using. Uh, this model uh, is a perfectly isotropic model in order to mimic the uh, elastic properties of the leaf. Uh, how good is this model? Do we, is there, do you think we have assumption behind it? Uh, 
when you reach the two velocity, the longitudinal one and the transverse wave in the leaf, you reach 172 meters per second for the shear and 295 for the longitudinal. So is it true in all the direction in the leaf? Because it's not perfectly uh, homogeneous. So how, um, how good are the, the, uh, the hypothesis in the model that you're using, David? Yeah, thank you, Stefan, for the question. Um, well, this is a model that uh, gives us an, appro an approximation of the effective properties considering that the, the leaf is a plate. Uh, at low frequencies, we see that this approximation is very good. But when we uh, go uh, at higher fre frequencies, this model is not good. For example, in the first cutoff frequency, uh, the model do not, uh, does not represent what is happening with the waves. At this moment, we are working uh, to find a, a better model for the leaf. But at lower frequencies, uh, around uh, 100 kilohertz, maybe 200 kilohertz, uh, we are obtaining good results uh, when we compare the results with another technique uh, in which uh, some researchers uh, use uh, destructive methods. Okay. All right. So uh, from Javier, thank you. You are here. You could uh, ask your question, but thank you for yeah <laughs> to do it, Javier. Okay, okay, I'll do it. it was just to, to motivate it, the people to, to write down in the chat your the questions. But David, thank you for your very nice presentation. It was it is an amazing work. So I was just wondering how are you planning to implement this uh, lab method you developed in, in real coffee plantations and, and what challenges are, are you expecting? Yeah, um, the next step in this work is to to test a whole plant, not a plantation, uh, a crop, but uh, a plant in the next step. The major challenge may be uh, are the, um, the direction of the leaves in a real plant. In our case, in lab, we can uh, put a total horizontal our samples and our laser vibrometer can measure and uh, normal to the surface. In a real plant, for example, this is not the case. And uh, the leaves have uh, many ori orientations. So this is a big challenge because our detector uh, is very sensitive to the orientation, for example. The other challenge are the natural processes inside the, in the plant. When we cut the leaf, that is the case of this first work. We, we can suppress um, some natural processes. So we can study uh, a sample that uh, have little changes in its inner structure. But when the leaf is in the plant, uh, there, are, there are photosynthetic uh, processes there are some ori orientations um, according to the illuminations around the plant. Uh, the plant also try to, to have some behaviors uh, if it has a good irrigation or bad irrigation. So uh, we need to address all this challenge. Okay, we have a question for, for Nicolas now. Uh, from Javier again. Uh, I, 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 yes, I can. I can. Nico, it, it, we know that uh, the measurements, the shear wave elastography measurements in muscles are very sensitive, particularly particularly to the pressure made by the probe or by the operator. So I, I don't know how sensitive is the surface wave method to the pressure. Because I saw that in the slaughterhouse, they, they use this like so 
it won't be such a it won't be very controlled pressure they make so how how did you solve this issue for your surface wave device and or if, if it's any sense making this this question okay thank you Javier uh, well it, it was not uh, solved in the in the presentation but in our prototype for the beef sample device you you we placed a pressure sensor at the bottom of the device so we, we can measure the pressure the, the operator is, is doing when when applying the, the device on beef and uh, we have set an optimal pressures uh, using a, a visual feedback with with uh, colored leds so uh, because if the pressure is not enough the the, the, the contact sensors do not record uh, well the, the vibration so the, the measurements not good and if you exert much pressure you can see the rise in your your speed value so there is an optimal range in pressure that we 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 established it empirically and uh, we use this um, yeah maybe it's a related question uh, nicola for yeah. you um so you're using a relay well surface wave speed and yes. the surface wave speed include a layer of uh, the skin of fat and then the muscle mm -hmm. so how can you be sure that what you are measuring is not uh, all behavior of all these layers rather well, than muscle behavior yes uh, well we are measuring the behavior of all these layers in fact but as, as the wavelength is is, is centimeter size and the, the the surface wave penetrates into the medium uh, almost one wavelength so most of the propagation is within the muscle but still we have propagation in, in the skin and in the fat and uh, what we measure is a, is a a value that uh, takes in, into account all of this, but most of propagation is on the muscle. So uh, we have to to deep the, the analysis and the research on, on this, but we believe we are getting back the, the essentially the, the muscle. Yeah, uh, the when there is contraction, there is no doubt that the contraction comes from the muscle and yeah. not from the fat, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay. So maybe I have some more questions from David. So let's go back to you, David. Um, so um, I was wondering, you said that you could measure the water content. How from the ve velocity measurement that, that you have, P wave and S wave, do you deduce the water content? I did not get this point, uh, David. Yeah, uh, we know uh, that the that the signals we were measuring with the LDV, the vibrometer, uh, were sensitive to the water content of the samples. In this presentation, I didn't show uh, how this is related, but for example, the amplitude, the energy of the signals uh, shows uh, a relationship um with the water content uh the speed uh, with the speed we have not seen at uh, this moment one relationship maybe because we are working at low frequency so the sensitivity is not good that's uh, one of the things we want to do uh, at higher frequency to see if the elasticity modulus or the speed comes to be uh, sensitive to, to the water content. Uh, but in terms of the energy of the signals, we can see it and measuring in both the midrib and in the lamina. And also we note that the relationship with the water content is opposite. I mean, when the energy on the, of the signals measure at the lamina decrease with the water content for example when the water content decreases in the leaf in the midrib we note 
that uh, when the water content in the leaf is decreasing, the energy of the signals is, uh, is decreasing also. Uh, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> if uh, the idea is clear. I mean, in the mirror, we see an increasing pattern and in the lamina, a decreasing pattern. Okay, so the effect of the water content is more on the energy rather than on the speed of the guided waves. At the frequency we are working, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Oh, uh, have... another yes. another annotation. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, the first cutoff of the antisymmetric mode also displays to lower frequency when the um, when the relative water content of the samples is decreasing also. So this this is a link between higher modes and the current water statutes in the leaf. That also we know the, in our experiment. Okay. So we have a question from Miguel. Bonjour, Miguel. Uh, to Nicolas. Now uh, he's wondering how do you test the different cuts in the muscle experiment knowing that they have different conformation of muscles with fiber with fibers is different directions sorry uh, in the slaughterhouse measurements how do you test the different cuts knowing that they have different conformation of muscles with fibers yes i, I understood the question all right thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, before uh, before going to the slaughterhouse, we did a, a previous research uh, with the uh, um, ultrasound images of uh, of the of the cats. We 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 wanted to to try to know where uh, the fiber direction uh, was oriented. Uh, even that, there, there are some cut types that are, are very challenging because they are not one single muscle, but they, they, they are different muscles with different uh, uh, fiber orientation. So th th this, kind of this kind of cuts are, are challenging for, for, our, for, our, for our prototype, for our device. And we have to select some region when, where we know the fiber orientation is more or less parallel to the surface. But yes, you are, you are right. Uh, th there are some, some cut types that we, we cannot still measure very well. So um, I have another question for you, uh, Nicolas, uh, concerning the RCA, so the row column uh, uh, matrix that you're using. Uh, so I don't know much about that. How big can it be? Can you really image uh, all, um, I don't know, organs with that? Sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear you. But, so the image that you made, how yeah. big was it? And how big can we go with RCA uh, row column uh, uh, sound uh, uh -huh. probe that you're using? Uh, well, um... I don't remember the, the the size of our our row column array, but uh, it's not so large. It, uh, the volume was in the, the presentation. I don't remember. Okay, Miguel says it's uh, twenty five. Oh yeah, twenty five. Twenty five by twenty five millimeters. Yes. <laughs> All right. Still okay. 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 So, do you think we can enlarge that? How? Um, as much as we want, just by using, you know, a really long row and a really long column, no, or is there a limit? I don't think so, because the, sp the, the spatial resolution in the lateral direction depends on these cross links. In, in, of yes. So unless you have a, 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 a large amount of channels, if, oh, if you okay. keep the, the number of channels, we will lose spatial resolution and we cannot do it very large. Okay. All right. Mm. Okay. Uh, and maybe one more. Do, do you have a simple explanation, as simple as possible, uh, 
if it, that gives the reason why the Lichy wave would be twice as fast as the Shear wave? Uh, <laughs> yes. I, well, I don't have a, uh, a reason a for that. It's the, w when you do the math, you can see that yeah. the, 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 you, have, you have the Rayleigh -like circular equation and you have the real root which, correspond, which corresponds to the Rayleigh -like wave. And the, co the real part of the complex root, which is the leaky wave, gives you a, a velocity twice as the, the real, as the Rayleigh wave. But why it is this, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there should be a reason, I think. Yeah. OK. Thank you, Nicola. Is there other questions there? Um, let's see. I don't see any. Do I have some more than one? Um, there is a, a there is a question by Akash Chandra, I believe. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. To Nicholas again. Yes. So I will have another one for for you, David. After that. So maybe I start with David. Back to David now. Uh, when you use the laser, do you uh, have more energy with the A zero mode or the S zero mode in the leaf? Um, in the leaf, we have. Um more uh, more detection, more signal to noise radio with the anti-symmetric modes. Um, because of our detector, we did not see uh, the symmetric mode. So okay. we were only working with, with the anti-symmetric zero order. Okay. Okay, you, you don't have the sensitivity to detect it because it should have a vertical component as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the sensitivity is not good enough. All right. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm. All right. So to Nicola now. Um, so from Akash uh, Chandra, uh, if I want to focus on particular muscle, what challenges can we face during shear wave elastography sway, such as solus leg muscle? And what size of region of interest, Roy, should we select for measurement of shear wave imaging? So, Nicolas? Okay. Yes. Well, I'm not good in anatomy, so I, I'm not sure where the, where the solus is. But what can I say is that uh, uh, if, if the muscle is deep in, in, in the body, uh, it, it is more challenging to match the, the elasticity because you have to reach it with the push to generate the shear wave and then image the the shear wave propagation which as the dip increases uh, there is there is a more noise due to attenuation so it becomes it becomes more challenging to, to image a, a deep deep muscles i don't know if this is the question uh, and the, the the region of interest the size of the region of interest will depend on uh, how, how good are your, your signals? So the solus is uh, the mole. So uh, down there, uh, well, you know, the mole, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I, we have not uh, much experience imagine this, this particular muscle, uh, but I- Yeah, I, but I, I the guess, fibers, the fibers yes, are yes, not... Yes, I, I guess it's a penated uh, mass, yeah. so the fibers are not parallel to the surface. So it this adds an extra uh, challenge to image because we can you can measure the, the, the speed, but this is not simply related to a shear modulus. You have to do some computation. Maybe you have to measure in different directions to get uh, meaningful values of, of the shear modulus. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, so there's no more questions there. Uh, I don't know, uh, me, me neither. So I don't know, we can, if, if we are down for everybody, maybe we can uh, 
we can stop here. What do you think? Is there anybody who wants to ask or say something, a comment? No? So okay, so we can, uh, we can thanks both presenters there again for their presentation. Thank you very much, David and uh, Nicolas. Okay, thank yeah. you for being Bravo. here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. And uh, that's it for me. So what's the plan now? So uh, I, I think I think I just go ahead and, and wrap things up for for this first webinar. So some uh, some quick announcements for for the end. So let me see how. So thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this first webinar of this uh, UFSC Society Latin America webinar series. Just to let you know that our next webinar will be on the 1st September and there will be two talks, one featured by Hector Estrada from Chile, who will be talking about optically guided transcranial ultrasound stimulation in mice. And our main speaker, sorry, our main speaker would be Marco Aurelio Andrade from the University of Sao Paulo, who will be talking about acoustic levitation methods for suspending and manipulating objects in mid-air. This <laughs> webinar will be moderated by Karen Patricia Folke Sepúlveda from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And connection details will be announced through the UFSC website and social media channel. Additionally, the UFSC Virtual Lecture Education Series has an upcoming lecture on the 12th of July featuring a talk uh, by Himanshu Shekhar, who will be talking about musings in biomedical ultrasound, advancing cavitation mediated therapy, image guidance and monitoring. So we are all invited to join this uh, virtual lecture education seri series as well. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. Hope you hope I see you all in in the next webinar. And please uh, fill the survey in in the touch box in the chat box before you leave. Thank you, thank you very, thank you all of, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.